Uh, I just love the church, eh? And what you're doing here is phenomenal. And I just want to congratulate you on the vision and congratulate you for getting behind it and making this work. This is just the beginning of something incredible. And uh, I really do believe in you as a church. You know, the last week we are, Grace and James, my daughter and son-in-law and kids, we went to Fraser Island for a couple of days in the rain, um, which is very interesting. We were looking for Sunshine Coast, but anyway, uh, we, we had the rain and we had one good day up there and, you know, it was okay. We stayed at the Caravan Park and, you know, got bogged a couple of times and all those things that you do and, and you know, the showers were average and then we went to come down to Nooseville and stayed there for two days and that was much better. Then we came here. It was just like upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. And uh, I had a shower this morning and it was just like, I didn't want to get out of under the shower. I felt like all of, the, all of the grains of sand that were in all different places from, from you know, Fraser Island just got loosed and gone this morning. Uh, but it was so good to have a good shower. But you know, I was standing here this morning and I just want to congratulate the worship team. It, just, it was just like being in an unbelievable shower this morning. Just a fresh, you would just be dirty and you just come in and you just get under a good, hot shower and you just feel so refreshed when you get it. And I just congratulate the team. That's what it felt like this morning. You guys are doing outstanding. So thank you. Here you go. Ah, so good to be here. Hey, before I do go on, I do want to, uh, I don't do this enough really, but I do want to honour your pastors, Pastor Ashley and Alison. They have been friends of mine for many, many years and have journeyed me through some of the most difficult times of my life. And, you know, there's people that are there pivotal in some of those times. And it's interesting, some of the phone calls that I get at the pivotal time, just even recently, Ashley Ring says, I was just thinking, I said, I was about to ring, or either I rang you or you're going to ring me, but it was just like, what are you doing ringing me? I was just thinking of you, um, but just have spoken into my life and spoken into my world and the encouragement that comes from their heart to me personally and my family, you've got outstanding pastors, you need to love on them and be really thankful for them. I want to thank you both for your love. So when... When um, I got asked would I, would, would I preach, I, um, of course, I said, yes, absolutely, because I love this church. And uh, I just said, God, what? And, and this first, the first thought that came to my mind was a, a message that I wrote back in 2000 and, and really in 15 when I went through a, a, a difficult time in my life. And... Um, and I, I went back to it and said, God, this, I mean, I've got much better messages than this that I've written, you know, surely it's not. The, and I just, it was impressed upon me, you need to preach this message. And so I'm going to preach it to you. It's going to actually go this morning and tonight. So it's going to start this morning, it's going to continue through tonight. So if you're not a twicer, if you're not a Sunday morning and a Sunday night person, you're going to miss out unless you come. So we'd love to see you both to all of you tonight to come along to hear the end of it, but it's an activation message, but it's also very real to me because of what I went through in my life, but the message is entitled, Sideswiped or Set Up? It's your choice. Sideswiped or Set Up? Have you ever been in a car and just enjoying your day in your lane, just going your pace, you know, sitting on the speed limit, because we all sit on the speed limit, right? By the way, I'm my, I'm my third time losing my licence. But um, <laughs> third time, third time in my life. I'm down to no points. I think, I, no, they gave me two points for a year. So the cruise control is my best friend. Anyway, but you ever been on your, you know, in your lane doing your thing, going down your little road, and someone decides they want your space? They decide they're not just happy with their space, they want yours as well. And they sideswipe you and you find that you're in an accident that you didn't cause. You're in an accident that you didn't, weren't looking for and your day that you had, that you thought you were going to have, got totally ruined by this incident that happened. Ever been in one of those situations? Or maybe you're the other person who actually did the sideswiping, I don't know. 
You just didn't see them, of course. So, you know, just, you know. But sometimes that's what it's like in life, eh? We're just going on with our life. We're just heading on the journey, getting up the day, we're just going on, and all of a sudden, for some reason, the day doesn't end up like you thought it would. And something happens that it's like a side swipe comes and takes you out. You find yourself on the side of the road, not going to where you thought you were going, and you're in a situation that you weren't expecting, but here you are on the side of the road, not knowing what to do. And life is a little bit like that. And I'm sure some of you have been through circumstances like that. Certainly, I've been through quite a few significant times like that. When I was here last time, I preached about the fact of how I journeyed with the loss of my wife. And in that period of time, we also, um, Olive, who's here with us today, which is Grace's little girl, was born at 26 weeks um, gestation. And what, how she went through all of that. And, but she's gone really well. Her lungs are getting better. She's running around. And boy, does she keep going. But she's our little miracle baby. But it sideswiped our family. Right? And so I want to help you today to give you some, some practical things. It's a, a teaching message. But give you some practical things. If you find yourself in a situation like this, it could be your health. It could be even a business. It could be a marriage failure. It could be something that has happened to you that you weren't necessarily expecting and may not necessarily be in your fault, but here you are. And so I want to take you over to a story. It's a, I'm going to read the majority of it. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's a story of Jehoshaphat. So I'm going to read through from, I think, the first 20 verses. 20 or so verses. So stay with me. I think that it's going to go. Great. There it is. Here we go. After this, we're going to get to that. After this. That's a really interesting thought. After this. Because something really happened before this. That's why it says after this. Right? It's really, it's really interesting, isn't it? Here, you've got to hear about a sideswipe moment that happened to, to Jehoshaphat. But he'd already been through a sideswipe moment. And the enemy tries to get you when you're down with another thing. Anyone found like that? I just got through this and you get hit with something else. Well, that was his after this moment back in chapter 18. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Meonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Eden, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar, which is then is at the En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all of the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built it in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Amon, Moab and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Don't we feel like that sometimes? Like, God, this is way too big for me. We have no power. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and the little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and a descendant of Asaph. 
as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, he prophesied, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They'll be climbing up via the pass of Ziz. And Ziz, Ziz, what a great name. And you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeriel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. I love this. Then some of the Levites from the Kohathites and the Kararites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Ju Judah and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men of, from Seir, they helped to destroy each other. They, they turned on each other and took each other out. Then the men of Judah came to the place that overlooked the desert and looked toward the vast army. They saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry, I love this bit, Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and other articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect. How good's that? Yeah. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakar where they praised the Lord. This is why they, they called the valley of Barakar to this day. Amen, 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 amen. An incredible story. An incredible story. We know the story well. But I just want to give you really some points out of this. That maybe we skip over little things, we don't see them. And somehow, some of these things that happen to us, we don't understand how we should respond because usually we take it on as our problem where it's not our problem at all. So, point number one, if you take notes, don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. When you get sideswiped, don't look at it as if there's something wrong with me. Listen to what they said to Jehoshaphat. Verse one, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites came out to Meonites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people, we'll talk about them in a moment, some people came to, Jeho to Jehoshaphat and said, a vast army is coming against you. These people who are around him said, it's coming against you. It's your issue. They're coming to get you. And when situations happen in our life, do we not immediately make it about us and think we've done something wrong. Why has this happened to me? It's all about me. And we all of a sudden lose focus of what's happening out there and we come inward. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants, you to, he wants to isolate you to make it about you, where it's not about you at all. You know, most of the attacks, I'm going to say this, and this one you might go, wow, really? Most of the attacks that come against us personally it's really attacking the church ultimately. It's not really about you at all. The devil could care less about you. He actually wants to get to you so he get to the church that you're attached to because he hates the church because Jesus came to set the church up. Jesus died for the church. He doesn't care about you, but if he can attack you and make you think it's you, he'll isolate you to take you out. To under Please understand the attack is not against you. It's against the church. So don't let it be personal. It's not about you at all. 
The enemy loves to isolate. 1 Peter 1, 5, verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion for someone. Someone. He goes after the one, right? But understand, it's not about you. Don't let it become personal. Even when you have a report from the doctor, brother, that the report you got, it's not about you. You haven't done anything wrong. Right? But let's take it to God. Because he's the one that wins the war. Right? Satan loves to get to our vulnerable areas. Our humanity is fragile and we've got weaknesses. And he uses fear. He twists words. He did it to Eve in the garden. He loves preying on the vulnerable parts of our lives so to ensnare us. I want to tell you, it's not your fight. It's not your fight. He attacks you to attack the church. Number two. This is a big one. Beware of the some people voices. The some people voices. Verse two. I could spend a week on this chapter, seriously. Verse two. Some people, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you. Who are these some people? How the heck did these some people get to Jehoshaphat in the first place? Obviously, they were close enough to speak, but you notice the Bible doesn't record their name. They're faithless, therefore they're nameless. They're not going to get their name in here because they're not speaking the Word of God. They're not speaking the purpose of God. They're not prophesying the Word of God. They're not giving encouragement. They're just the some people voices. They don't even have a name. They're the bad news type. They're the crowd type. They're the ones, you know, you know everybody's saying, you know. You heard that, that people come, I mean, leaders, people running businesses. If you own a business with more than one, one person, at, you know, one employee, beware of the some people voices. Beware of, you know, they're all saying, well, who are they? But we listen to the some people voices. Yet there was a man who was close enough called Jehaziel. You notice we know his name? Because what did he do? He prophesied the word of the Lord. Jehaziel, he stood up and he brought the word of the Lord. By the way, the word Jehaziel means this, beheld of God. Beheld of God. I did a whole message on the word behold. I might actually include it a little bit in, in, in tonight tonight's service but the word behold is really interesting it's really interesting to give you a little little snippet of it when you do you remember the time where you sat on a beach and you watched the sun go down and all of a sudden you you were talking to someone and they said shh stop and you just watched the sun go down and the beauty of the sunrise and you beheld the sun going down or the sun coming up. As I said that, some of you will be able to even, in your mind's eye, go back to exactly where you were. Some of you were sitting on a beach in Bali. Some of you are sitting at a sunrise out here just at Mooloolaba. Some, some of you will know where you were, even the person you're with, or what was happening at that time. Because it wasn't just a moment of, yeah, that's a nice sunrise. It was a moment of beholding. And we can recall the beholding moments because beholding has an emotional effect on us that, that gets inside of us that we can draw on that moment to bring out the emotions and the understanding of all of what happened. So when this man is, he's beheld of God. God just didn't say, oh, this is Jehaziel. He actually beheld him. He knew him. He looked at him. He could actually bring something back in, within his psyche to even understand this man is something. And when we've got a beholding understanding, like when John the Baptist baptised Jesus, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God. Just don't think he's a man. Look at him. And here is Jehaziel. 
behold, he's the beheld of God. And he starts to speak. We know his name because he brought life. He brought the word of God. He stood up and he spoke life into the situation. We need some more Jehaziels in our lives. We need to identify the Jehaziels. Stop listening to the some people voices. I can tell you, Pastor Ashley is a Jehaziel to me. The right time, it just speaks life. You need Jehaziels. Let me ask you a question. Who's your Jehaziel? I need another question. Why don't you be a Jehaziel? Why don't you be a Jehaziel to some other people? And don't be the some people voices speaking the obvious. You know what some people do? They talk the obvious. As if Jehoshaphat didn't know the armies were coming from the south and the east and coming all around him. He didn't need to be told that. But the some people don't give you any revelation. They just tell you the obvious. And we get scared of this thing that comes from, listen, where there's a some people, there'll be a Jehaziel. Look for the Jehaziels. 1 Peter 3 verse 12 says this, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. I could go in a lot into this whole little thing. You know, just, just think about this, David and Goliath. David and the army. David goes with his little cheese platter to his brothers. Here's about Goliath. There was a big valley between them. Children of Israel, the army of Israel, and the other army on the other side, and here's Goliath in the middle yelling out. This is the interesting thing. When you read this, when you read the whole passage of David and Goliath, they could tell you a heck of a lot about that, that giant. He was huge. This is what the Bible says. He was huge. He was not, get this, he was nine and a half feet tall. How did they know that? Because they studied him. He had a war of bronze armour He weighed, that weighed 5,000 shekels. He wore bronze greaves, which are like leggings on to protect your legs. He had a javelin, a spear, and an iron point that alone weighed 500 shekels or 15 pounds. His armour alone weighed close to 200 pounds, maybe more. The guy was massive. But they knew all that. Why did they know it all? Because they were listening to the wrong voice. They knew more about their enemy than they knew about their God. They studied their enemy more than they studied God. Here comes little David. Who is this Philistine that talks against the armies of God? You know, if you read it, he spoke Goliath's name twice. And he spoke the name of God twice seven times. Maybe in our situations we should actually say the name of Jesus far more than we say the name of the thing that's against us. But you know what we do? We go to Dr. Google and we look up all the ailments and all the things and we actually, we want to know everything. That's, we're listening to the voices of the obvious instead of listening to the voices of the Jehaziels who will speak life and, and, and power and authority into our life. Number three. Is this okay? Number three. Turn your fear into fervor. Turn your fear into fervor. It's a bit like Pastor Danny now, and I'm just getting my everything in the alliterations happening. Verse three. Let me give you a paraphrase. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. This is the New Living Translation. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin a fast. So people from all over the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat was freaking out. And you know what? It's okay to have a freak out moment. It's okay to be human. It's okay to have your moment but don't stay there Jehoshaphat could have went down that fear road he could have went down that Google road he could have went searching for hours and hours and found out everything was wrong he could have found out if he had Googled then that this is related to that and that's related to that and that's related to that and all of a sudden every part of his body is dying because he's got all of these ailments that are based on hearsay instead of understanding that he had a God 
But what Jehoshaphat did do, he was terrified, but then he did this. And with this news, he begged the Lord for guidance. He turned his fear into a fervor to turn to God and say, but you, but you. Notice his prayer. He actually never, I, I, I looked at it again this morning. He never said anything about the, the enemies. He never talked about how big they were, how unbelievable fighters they were. He never talked about anything to do with them. He actually, his prayer was everything about God, you promised this. God, you promised this. God, you did this in the past. You gave us this land. These people are coming against us. You told us not to go and get them, so we did, and now they're coming back to get us. So God, you are the one that we're standing in the presence of. You are the one we're looking to. You got to come through with an answer. He turned his fear into fervor. Jehoshaphat had a spiritual response instead of an emotional one. Oh, we're allowed to talk about emotions. It's okay to have emotions. Just don't let them rule you. The emotional response says this. This always happens to me. I knew it. The doctor said it would happen. Happened to my mum, so it's going to happen to me. My dad died of this, and it's going to happen to me. I should have expected it. We fill our head with information that we know more about ourselves than the doctor does. We're not happy when we go to the doctor and the doctor says this. So no, 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 we're not happy with that, so we'll go and find another doctor to actually to, to, to agree with us with what we think is happening to us. You know people like that? No, no one here. Once again, we know more about the giant than we do about our God. But I love what Jehoshaphat did. He just went to God and started laying it all on him. You said, you did, you promised. Musicians come. Here's the emotional response. So that's the emotion. Here's the spiritual response. It's found in Psalm 18. I love it. It says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my saviour. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. He turned his fear into fervor. It's okay to have a moment of fear. Just don't let it rule you. Turn it into further and let it drive you to God and say, God, you said, you promised. Now expect you to do it. I think I've told you the story about where Sue and I many years ago were told we couldn't have children. I've told, uh, told you this story. I've encouraged some of you. It's quite, it's funny now as I tell it. It wasn't funny then. We tried for years to have children. Literally, this was, you know, internet was still sort of just being born then. So my wife had graphs and charts the doctor, that were so good that the doctor took them all. I felt like a bull. I had to come home at certain times and certain moments to do all the things you have to do, right? To have a baby. It's like, now, get home now. But I'm working. No, you need to come now. So we did all of that. Nothing worked. So we went and sought medical help and Sue had a few things that she needed to get fixed. And I had a lot of things. I thought it was all her. And it turned out it was mainly me. So I had, you know, some little fellas that swam the wrong way, apparently. And they had weird heads and no tails. And I don't know how they work out which way they swim. Do they put a little arrow on the glass and put it there and go swim this way? I don't know, but they just weren't swimming the right way. <laughs> Anyway, I went and saw the specialist and uh, he said, look, we can do an operation on you uh, and we can fix this, but I don't even think that's going to work. You are, you are heading in the wrong direction. Not just those things, but the amount of those things were just heading in the wrong direction. Right? It was very low. So I was fearful. I, 
I really believe we have kids. I, I had a scripture, you know, I might have been out of context as, con- context as a young Christian, but it's, you know, the scripture is every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. And I just hang on to that because I believe kids are a, an unbelievable gift. And I was thinking, God, why wouldn't you want more kids to be raised as Christians in this land and they're not? Certainly you want more Christians here, right? It was a, a shallow prayer, but a fervent prayer. And uh, the doctor said, look, Unless your count is of this level, I am not going to do the procedure on you at all. Now understand, I was so low that even to get to that point was ridiculous. And something rose within me, fear to fervor. I said, do you know who I am? This is to the specialist. Do you know who I am? He went, Stephen Hilda. (laughs) I said, I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. And I believe God's told us we're going to have kids. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to come back in three weeks time. And my count is going to be over what you need. You will operate and we will have kids. And he said, I hope you're right. And I walked out and my wife looked at me as if, who the heck are you? But something came over me that wasn't prepared to accept the report. And I said to Sue, I said, well, I didn't put myself on trial here. I've just put God on trial. Either He is true to His Word or He's not. And this is not my issue. This is now his issue. Three weeks later, we come back. Bang, we're over. Went and had the procedure. Now I have three beautiful daughters. I've got four beautiful grandkids. But the enemy didn't want that to happen. He wanted the fear to override my faith. Last point for this morning. Singers come as well. Because we're going to do some magnifying in a moment. This is a, this is a really big point. Magnify to nullify. Magnify to nullify. The voices when you are sidelined get really, really, really loud. And they start speaking all sorts of things in your mind. You're going to lose your business. If you don't get enough money, if you don't get this contract, your wife's on the way out the door. You need to do something. This sickness is going to take hold and you're going to, you're going to go. The sidelining moment can get very loud. But Jehoshaphat did something to nullify the noise in his head. You've got to magnify who God is in your life to nullify the voices of the sideline moment. It said this, verse 5, Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the court of the new courtyard. And he said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, Are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands and no one can withstand you. What did He do? He magnified the greatness of God. He didn't say anything about the enemy, just like David didn't say anything about Goliath. Goliath was huge, but he trusted God in him. So Psalm 34, this is David. Oh, Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Where was Jehoshaphat? In the middle of the courtyard with all the fam- the families and the kids and all the aunties and the uncles and the great grandkids and the great grandparents. They were all in there together. Let us magnify the Lord together. Magnifying is looking like it's looking through the, you know, it's like looking through a, a little microscope. A whole new world opens up to you when you look into a microscope. I don't know if you're sitting, you know, the Little bugs that look like flies, they, look, they flip and look like aliens from outer space when you look through a microscope. Their hairs on their legs and their teeth are like huge, you know. 
you see something that you've never seen before when you magnify something. And the beauty of water, when you look at it through a micro microscope and, and other things, you see beauty that you've never seen before with a naked eye because you magnify something. You actually see, you see beauty that you haven't seen before. When you start to magnify Jesus, you see things in Him that you've never seen before. You know Him as your Saviour, you may know Him as your Lord, you may know Him as your friend, but when you start to magnify Him, you start to see Him as your healer. You start to see Him as your provider. You start to see Him as the one who says what He says and can accomplish what He said He's going to do when you magnify. <laughs> the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body. When you start to magnify Him, you start to see things you've never seen before. The microscope has to be focused. Get this, it's focused on the one thing. It's not all over the place. When you look into a microscope, you see, you close that other eye and you look down that microscope and you see one thing. When you magnify something, everything else becomes so small and it becomes irrelevant. When you magnify Jesus, you see the one person and the beauty to behold in Him. Here's the analogy. When you go into a doctor's surgery, if you've got an ailment or sickness, you go into a doctor's surgery, and if, if he's a good doctor, in the waiting room around the, around the walls, he's got his certificates hanging. He's got his authority that's been bestowed upon him for the exams that he's qualified for. You know, doctor this and doctor that and surgeon here. And he's got all his qualifications on the wall. And, and in that moment of anxiety, all of a sudden, oh, I'm in the right place. This guy may know what's happening to me and I may be able to get some help because he's got the authority from the people who know that they give him the authority to understand you more than you understand you. And he can deal with the ailment or the sickness you're working through. Why? Because he's authorised. But see, when you start to magnify Jesus, it's like going into the waiting room of Jesus. But you just don't see authorised surgeon certificates on, on the wall. This is what you start to see written on the walls of the waiting room as you start to enter into the place. You start to see this word, the risen Christ, the Son of the Most High God, Jesus, the great healer, the mighty conqueror, the defeater of sin and death, Saviour of the world, El Shaddai, the great provider, the word of life, the bread of life, Jehovah, the King, the great I am, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, our righteousness, the Lamb of God, the Lamb that was slain, the great shepherd, the light, His love, the hope of the world, the rock of my salvation, the gift of life. I could go on. When you start to magnify Jesus, you start to see who He is. And all of a sudden, that sideswipe moment becomes a setup for you to grow. A setup for you to realise that greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. That I've got a Saviour that is for me. That it doesn't matter if the that's coming against me and that army's coming against me and that army's coming against me and that army's coming against me. When I magnify God, all of that becomes insignificant because I start to see Him for who He is. Amen. We're going to do some magnifying right now. Is that, is that okay? And I don't know whether you've been sidelined or what, or you've, you know someone who's been sidelined or you've gone through, I don't know what the circumstances are, but certainly from reading some of the prayer points this morning, there's some people that feel like they've been sidelined. But I want us to do some practice this morning. Is that okay? Even if you have it, to, to get this into our spirit, to understand it. It's not about you. Don't think it's about you, right? Let's turn our fear into fervour. Let's magnify to nullify. And let's start to lift up the name of Jesus. So what we're going to do, the band's going to lead us in a song. And what we're going to do is just start to say, thank you, Jesus, that you're my provider. Thank you, Jesus, you're my healer. Thank you, Jesus, that you walk beside me. You never, never leave me nor forsake me. Thank you that I am made righteous in your sight. Start to thank Him and start to magnify who He is in your life. And let me tell you, other things become so insignificant. So can we stand to our feet?